rock and roll. Okay, we got, we got to get this show started here. You know, um, our job is to look at the things that are most important to our bottom line. So in this session, I want to cover what is most important for me, at least to my bottom line and what I see with others. And it has nothing to do with strategies, indicators, systems, you know, all this other kind of stuff. Okay. It has everything to do with not going on tilt, number one, and minimizing unforced errors, number two. And so what happens about this time of year, you know, we've just been through a tumultuous six months and it's kind of hard. You get caught into the groove and sucked into the game. And are we going to make that new high on the S&Ps? And then once we do, are we going to trade back below it? Are there gaps to be filled? And it can be nonstop. And so what happens is we get burned out. We don't even realize how burned out we are. So these are some of the things that I want to address because our whole goal is to walk away from the screens on your own terms and your own choice, not because you get disgusted with something that you have done and then need to take a break and you don't want to deal with the underlying issue, you see? So you want to, you, you know, it's like uh, being in the casinos. You want to leave when the context is not suitable for you, you know, and you want to call things on your own terms when to uh, to stop, not because you've done something dumb or have drained your capital. So um, this issue of burnout is honestly something that um, I've experienced every single year at some point. I'm just scrolling through all this stuff. And so I wanted to talk about um, just ourselves as people, you know, I don't want to get into all the psychobabble crap and talk about nutrition and energy and diet and all that kind of stuff. You know, I figure you guys are all smart enough to know that, right? You know, smart enough to know you need a good night's sleep. <laughs> so um, I just had a wonderful friend do an, a little webinar for us and I posted the link to my website. Her name is Mandy and she lives in Australia and, uh, she, I had the good fortune of becoming friends with her three years ago when I was uh, speaking in Melbourne. And she is just the warmest, most insightful person when it comes to coaching and talking about real human issues. And so I'm just going to start off with uh, a little phrase that she had that every successful trader has a dark past and every losing trader has a bright future. So myself, um, as a successful trader, I started off with a dark past. I started off like uh, burying myself in a, a takeover stock and spending five years, you know, digging myself out of the hole. And almost everybody I know has had uh, major uh blotches on their timelines. And then I've seen so many traders finally overcome that learning curve, finally find their own stride and uh, start to feel an increase in confidence and good about things. So, um, and, and everybody's going to fall into one of these categories in general. So, uh, you know, that's, those are words from Mandy. And she, get, she was talking about what are the things that we can control in our lives, especially in light of, you know, the start of this year. Uh, so I want to just touch on a few things. We can control our environment and, and when we do need to take a break. And also, just in case you've had a little bit of a, uh, a blip, you know, or a little bit of a drawdown, we never start with a clean slate. We're always starting in the presence with the now, okay? So it's really a word or a statement about our lifestyle. We can never just eradicate the history and wipe the slate clean. These are the things that make us who we are, all of us. So this is her name. I just put it up here. And like I said, well, uh, whoops. 
anyway, she's on my website, so you can uh, go there and see a free link. If you had to listen to any webinar this year that I felt was going to improve your bottom line the most, that is the particular webinar that I would uh, choose to direct people to. So let's now focus on today. I wanted to start off just looking at 2020 and then I kind of want to get a little fresh, you know, one or two ways of looking at things differently because that's always fun. You know, I like seeing the way that other people look at data and that's also something I want to talk about, you know, just the camaraderie that we all share and the importance of having other traders in our lives. Not that we're we're here to share trades with each other or dissect um, our own strategies with each other. In fact, a lot of times that's best left not said, okay? But there's a commonality that, you know, we all go through very similar experiences and, and uh, you know, just knowing that we're not alone in these things. And then lastly, I'm here, question and answers. We've got time uh, to do questions and answers on anything, and I can slide my charts right over onto this uh, webinar here so we can look at any charts as well. Okay, so first of all, this VIX was only up here one other time in the last two decades, and of course that was 2008, and everybody remembers that period. I mean, that was almost a, a bigger doom and gloom feeling at the time, this heaviness, because you had so many companies visibly implode. And I think that the damage uh, was a different type of damage for all of those who had gotten way over leveraged in real estate and so forth. So it was a different kind of implosion um, than what we've experienced in the last couple months. So the thing I wanted to point out with this this chart is that here we were joyfully trading in the third quarter and the start of uh, 2020 and uh, of course the the uh, health the pandemic etc cetera, etc cetera. but here we are right now and we are not even back to normal yet okay and I'm not talking about the pandemic I'm talking strictly about out the market, the indicators, the internals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So today we actually had the lightest volume day of the year, the NYSE, and uh, even with that, the volatility is staying very high now. VIX represents the implied volatility. So this is not the actual volatility, and I want to show you something sort of striking. This here is the underlying historic volatility. So while the implied volatility is still quite elevated, uh, the actual volatility has contracted back down to the levels that we were in uh, in January and February. You see that? So you could actually look at this on a number of indices, you know, the OEX, S&P underlying, and so forth. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that the spread between the actual volatility and the implied volatility is pretty high still for where we are at in this historic volatility. And what that tells me is that everybody is still very on edge. Everybody's very anxious. There's this elevated price that you have to pay for the options premium at this point that really is not justified it unless you're trading an underlying issue. Okay, so that's sort of this you know, the dust hasn't settled despite the fact that you can see here in the price action on the uh, S&P, it's been fairly well behaved as of recent. I mean, the, the NASDAQ had a little bit of up and down, back and fill, but the S&Ps have been fairly well behaved. This morning we came in and we only had a 13 point Globex range in the overnight session. The DAX had a very narrow range. So we have this huge spread between the implied and what is 
actually going on out there. So uh, that tells me that um, the psychology is still very nervous psychology. If we look at a few other things that happened this year, this is TLT. I could have just as easily put up a yield chart of the bonds, the 30 years or even the 10 years, but I thought this was radically striking about the enormous dislocation that we saw in markets that nobody's experienced. And so there's a lot of unprecedented things that happened in the first uh, half of the year. And I still think that this market has um, no idea of where the actual equilibrium level is going to come in. The reason I'm bringing these things up is in the second half of my talk, we're going to look at people's need for certainty as part of your personality profile and how that's going to fit into your individual makeup. This is simply a chart of M2. And I put this up again to show the unprecedented injection in liquidity. And so here at the market bottom in March, of course, everything was doom and gloom and record bearish sentiment because the Fed had not come in yet to really start to bail things out. And they just obviously shoveled piles of money, which is well accepted uh, in the market now. Everybody knows this now. But at the time, there was a lot of uncertainty until the Fed really stepped in. And this has been the big driver. So everybody wants to look at fundamentals or news. Um, all of that for me is completely out the window. It's strictly a monetary game right now. And the most extreme example I give to people anytime they start to talk about fundamental valuations is all you have to do is study the hyperinflation in Germany in the, in the early 20s when the Weimar Republic just printed money with abandon. And I believe that the stock market went up to 20,000 percent. And that was strictly due to the the hyperinflation monetizing and printing of money. So that is a legitimate driver. Not saying the Fed's going to hit that point now, but you know, it just kind of swamps all the cases against fundamental valuations going forward. <laughs> how quickly we forget. Did you, did how many of you were watching the crude contract when it hit minus 40 because nobody had the capacity to take delivery? I bet you most people have forgotten about that now, unless I threw up a chart to remind some of the crazy things that, you know, we witnessed. And, uh, you know, I would not have wanted to be uh, one of the traders caught in that little uh, vortex there, but it was unprecedented. We've never seen that before. And so, uh, and then lastly, some of the stock moves, I, I know I've looked at Wayfair, you know, tripling, quadrupling and so forth. And, uh, you know, this is just a dramatic statement. Who would have foreseen that Tesla was going to go from 400 to 1600? So crazy moves if you trade options, you just can't see these types of things coming. So it, again, this inability to put things in a proper context, to have historical reference points, creates additional uncertainty, creates additional anxiety. And all of that can be really wearing to us. I read this today. I love this um, podcast. This I sometimes I download these things and listen to them in my car as I'm driving, and I have two main sources for these. This is the Waiters Pad. Um, you can just simply Google that, and then there's another one, Farnham, the Knowledge Project. So if you simply Googled Farnham, the Knowledge Project, there's some 
excellent podcasts. And sometimes I find it refreshing to listen to uh, these other people talk about non-related fields to the markets. I don't know about you guys, but do you ever get tired of hearing the same old lines on market psychology, market, you know, things that we need to do? I'd much rather read the parallels and analogies from sports and you know, other arenas in life and bring those into the trading environment. So this just struck me. Uh, I love some of Annie Duke's um, podcasts and, and TED Talks and, and some of her writings. And it struck me that she's talking about her poker coaching and how difficult it is to get people to pass on their hands, you know, because it feels like you're not doing anything. It feels like you're not playing the game. How can I be a trader if I'm not pulling the trigger and making trades? I should be doing something. I should put something on and start managing it. But instead, she, she said that she tries to teach people to frame it out in a different context so that you say, I'm choosing to pass, I'm choosing to fold because that's what the smart players do at certain times. They recognize the importance of capital preparation, or uh, capital preservation, blah, blah, blah. okay. <laughs> so phrase it out this way, smart traders know when to stand aside and do nothing. This is very much a part of our business knowing when to stand aside and do nothing. And so if you put it in this context, you know, and frame it out, it makes it okay to sit on your hands when conditionals are marginal. And I know that not everybody's going to go through with a rigorous check sheet, you know, every time they make a trade and say, okay, is this a 90% probability trade or a 50% probability trade? We simply don't do that, you know, as the day unfolds. And I've never done that. I know damn well when I'm taking a marginal trade, but I know even more importantly, when that door just opened and that is that rare opportunity to go in and tee it up. And that simply doesn't happen that often. So I'm trying to lead you to the path that it's okay to schedule a vacation and it's okay to take a break. And sometimes the only way that we do these things is to schedule something in advance. And sadly, in this day and age, it's not like you can schedule a trip to Greece or schedule a cruise on a cruise ship or, you know, but you can be creative and say, you know, maybe I need to go camping for the weekend or something like that. Now, here is what happens when we start to get burned out. And you tell me if you have uh, found this to be true with yourself. When we are burned out, we are much more susceptible to all these little cognitive biases that cause us to, you know, find little potholes in our, uh, in our program. So I just thought I would touch bases on one or two of these, and I know that you guys know what they are, but confirmation bias, let's say that you have a thesis that the market should make new highs or the market should sell off, and then you go and you selectively look for all the pieces of information that support that. So that's a pretty common thing to do when we get a little bit tired and burned out. It's harder to trust our own thinking and we'll gravitate towards other people, be it on, you know, social media or on television or a colleague or friend, we'll gravitate towards those that support our thesis. And it's harder to keep an open mind and see both sides of the coin. So I thought this was pretty cute. Everything I find that agrees with what I think reminds me of how right I am. And, you know, all these great traders that you hear, the Tudor Jones and, and so forth, you know, will be saying, where can I go 
wrong. I know Ray Dalio has posited that a couple times. Where would our analysis be incorrect? And sometimes when we get tired, the easiest course of action is non-action when we should be taking action. It gets much easier just to sit with something and think, oh, it's light volume, it'll come back, or we'll just put our head in the sand until that loss gets too big that it forces us to do something. And you don't want to do that. Um, just a couple other things I wanted to touch on. The overconfidence after we've had a good run. Let's say you caught a nice piece of that gold or silver trade or the currencies, uh, you know, something along that line. Let's say that you had a big win. And of course, that's often when we need to pull in the horns and walk away from the table because it's very easy to double dip. I mean, I'm guilty of that. I I have many friends that are guilty of that. You want to go back to the well because it felt so good. And that's right when the environment changes into more of a balancing or bracketing market, which has very spiky tests up and down if we're not careful. Witness the gold right now. So that overconfidence bias causes us to drop guard and underestimate risk. And that's particularly what we do when we start to get a little bit burned out. And the rest of these, I know you're all familiar with uh, the optimism bias. In general, humans tend to be more optimistic than warrants about our own abilities. I'm not talking about the outlook for our economy or our bottom line or our ability as traders. I'm talking about, yes, I am talking about, we're overly optimistic about our ability as traders, you know? And uh, so therefore, use that to, uh, you know, keep up your guard that, that we'll think that we manage trades better than we do, or we'll think that we see setups better than we do. And that's the point of rigorous statistical modeling. It's not per se that we expect that we're going to come up with a system. But if I ask the computer a question and then it shows me all the spots that answered that question, here's what's going to happen. My eye, when I study the charts, is going to gravitate towards all the cases where my particular setup or conditions worked. All right. Oh, yeah, it looks real good there. And what I don't see is all the times that it didn't work where it was just noise. But here's what's happening. We're trading on the right side of our chart, meaning we don't have the benefit of hindsight. So when you study charts, we can go and see all the cases where it worked. You know, but when you're in the thick of that noise, you get a lot of uh, false signals that we just tend to kind of overlook a little bit. So um, this, you know, statistical modeling and showing us truly the times that it doesn't work, we tend to be overly optimistic that something's going to work when we come up with a new setup or a new pattern. We'll think that it works better than it does. And, you know, losses. I'm going to talk just a little bit about, um, you know, how uncomfortable uh, these things are at the second half. And I, I'm not going to go into ego bias. Now, I just wanted to give you two things to take away that are different ways of looking at things. Um, I know that many of the people in this forum are really good with market profile concepts. And I also know that there are uh, newer people that are always looking for unique things uh, to walk away with. And I love this expression, cave fill. So for years, I've had a little small Skype group um, 
about three to four people and everybody trades a different market and different style and you know nobody posts their trades or what they're actually doing but it's more you know sharing charts with each other so I have this friend his name is Carlos who lives out in Colorado that I have known for 18 years on Skype and I have never met face to face isn't that amazing I can tell you that this guy grows hydroponics in his backyard, that his wife is a doctor, that he takes gets the kids off to school. I can tell you so many things about him. He used to be, uh, you know, a, a physicist and, uh, you know, so forth, but I've never met him. I hardly even know what he looks like. But this is the wonderful thing about this medium that we're in, that, you know, we can develop this camaraderie with, uh, with each other. So he shared this wonderful thing called the cave fill play. So I put up a chart of the 120 minute cold, okay? And here we had this big sideways line, this high volume node, if you want to put it into market profile terminology. And that simply means that the market spent a lot of time at this particular level and developed value here. So this is what I call a home call it what you will. And then on the upside breakout where all the algos goosed us because of course we were going for that all time new highs in the US session. Um, very sharp and steep markup that didn't get traded through, didn't get developed. And so this is another kind of fun analogy that my friend Carlos called the spike and channel. So you get your initial big spike up here and it's like a pole and then you channel. And of course this one channeled for quite a ways. He likes to take the length of the spike and double that and then that reaches your channeling a measured move to the upside. Just real roughly. In this case, it was not a perfect example, but suffice to say, you did a, a little loss of momentum up here and started to develop again. And when we broke that support, the play was for the cave fill, okay? Because we didn't develop this area very much, you had to go back and repair, as Dalton would say, you know, repair the anomalies or the potholes. And it's anytime you see these little gap areas or these single prints, that's exactly the way that you should treat it as a gap. And very often when a gap is first traded into, you know, the first test of the gap often doesn't fill it. Okay. In this particular case, it did very quickly. So now we have another construct at work. We traded back into this prior range. We should find support at the previous node or value area, whatever you want to call these semantics. And if instead you don't find support here, we are going to look below that previous low there. So all of a sudden, this is the level coming into play and we knifed right through that. So this conceptual framework is something that you can carry forward with you and you can see this on five minute charts, hourly charts. I come in first thing in the morning and all I do is I scroll through the 120 minute charts on my 16 main futures markets and I just write down, I try to make a note if there's a good bull or bear flag on the 120 or 240 minute that formed in the overnight session. It just takes me one minute. And I'll just simply make note if there's little cave fill areas that could come into play during our US pit session. Okay, so we, we actually knife down quite low. And then if you noticed today on that rally, once we took out that 61 previous high, on the gold, what did we do? We just traded partway into this area of single prints. 
So these are good structural things that you can look at. I don't need these Keltner channels. I don't even really need the volume nodes, although they are very helpful. You can just draw horizontal lines that kind of frame these things out. You simply don't need the oscillator patterns. Uh, so you can learn just to see things with a bar chart there and get good at that. And the more charts you look at, the better you improve. So that, I thought, was just a nice little takeaway for today. Now, let's just look at big picture, the volume distribution on the S&Ps. And I used TPOs because the volume here is not quite as uh, relevant if I'm looking at a September contract. So you can pretty much consider this to be the same thing. You see that we came out of a huge base. This was a substantial, quote, uh, value area that formed above that March low. And it really supported this whole trend up that we've been uh you know, un unfolding here. And we've got a major uh, pivot point right in here, this 3320. And, uh, you know, we just tested into this little bit of a fill here. So not any dynamic cave fill areas. This has been fairly well behaved. I think the market would be in trouble if we started trading back down below this. I just don't see that happening right now. And we've had a good markup and we've started to fill range here. So we've got a lower end of the range that was the reaction down the upper end of the range. And it's one scenario can be that we continue to trade around in here to develop and see if we can shift some of this range and value area back up here. And some of these markets, like the Russell Index, for example, very strong move to the upside. I don't see that completely falling back down. So in our spare time, we can just look at levels on different time frames in different markets, see where the main structural points are, swing highs and swing lows, and where these volume nodes are now. If you don't have, this is actually CQG's volume profile, but if you don't have that software, it doesn't matter because all you need to do is start drawing horizontal lines through the most amount of bars and you will start to come up with exactly that same type of feeling. So always just training our eye. Now I want to launch into the second half of this top, uh, talk. Okay, you know, we did lose power on Monday uh, for this storm that blew through Chicago, I don't, I'm sure some of you heard that, 500,000 people lost power. It's, you know, I'm like, I left Florida so I wouldn't have to deal with this nonsense. And it was a real freak, 20, 30 minute storm at the most that managed to take down power for 500,000 people. And naturally, like Murphy's Law, ComEd had half of their workforce on the East Coast dealing with, you know, hurricane cleanup over there. So of course they didn't have the crews here to get our power back up. So we didn't get power back until Tuesday afternoon, unfortunately. So I'm a little bit sleep deprived, but this is actually something that Mandy brought up from her talk that she did on Monday. And you're wondering, now, how did I hear Mandy's talk on Monday? <laughs> I heard her talk sitting in the car with my iPhone plugged into the battery charger on the car because my, our power had, had drained everything. So I thought this was really important to, you know, to touch bases with, with these, these issues that people tend to equate their net worth with their self-worth, especially in this trading business. You know, I've seen so many people uh, look at their own self-worth as being denominated by their bottom line in their trading account. And that is totally sick.
It's totally sick. Your self worth, of course, has nothing to do with how much P and L you you know you've you've uh, managed to accumulate over the last month or two. And so the money is simply a vehicle for trying to meet your needs. But if you had all the money in the world, it is not going to help you meet all your needs. All right. Yes, you can buy nice things, but it's not addressing those needs. And, and when these needs are not addressed, you know, that's where it comes into play in our trading. So I just wanted to touch on a, a few of these. The first four that I mentioned are considered uh, personality things. All right. So for example, certainty and comfort. This may apply to some people more than others, depending on your individual personality. But it is very human need to want to feel in control and to know what is coming next so we feel secure. That is human biology. Our need for basic comfort, you know, comes from the need also to avoid pain and stress. It's a survival mechanism, okay? That's, you know, that's basic survival. And so this is something that's human that's kind of contradictory to the fact that we're dealing with markets where uh, uncertainty is at its highest and, uh, you know, you have to feel comfortable taking risk. So if you are a personality type that has a high need for certainty, nothing right or wrong with that, but you're going to feel a lot less comfortable assuming risk or that you can emotionally bear. So if you put yourself in a tenuous situation trading and you assume a little bit too much risk or you don't manage it properly, that's going to be an emotional whiplash to you that's going to affect you perhaps more than another individual. So be sensitive to your own particular makeup. It doesn't mean that you can't make it as a trader, but you're going to need to be a lot more conscientious about not putting yourself in extremely uh, vulnerable situations or on the flip side. I have seen people that have that need for certainty and they can do very well trading a mechanical system or a very systematic approach. And the reason is they're very certain of their numbers. They've done their development themselves. They've watched the system for years and years and they know that if they follow their system, they have a certain degree of certainty that they will make money. And I have a very good friend, Bob Buran is his name, and he exactly fits this profile. He doesn't like trying to go in and trade in the markets with lots of uncertainty, even though he trades super high beta stocks. He feels his certainty from trading his system, and all of his entries are mechanical. He does use discretion in managing them. But this this problem of the fact that it's a human need for us to have certainty and comfort is a little bit of a challenge dealing with the markets. Another thing, this variety, okay? Yes, we do like good surprises. And this is actually in quotes because I copied it from uh, something that Tony Robbins expressed. Uh, we like good surprises. Right? The bad surprises are called problems. So yes, I want variety, but only give me the good variety, right? You know, I want to walk into Baskin and Robbins and taste 31 different flavors of ice cream, but I don't like the bad surprises. But unfortunately, this is part of life. So when these different surprises and things that crop up, um, you know, be it pandemic or market events or uh, outliers, you know, all kinds of, uh, unfor you know, having our power go out for two days, you know, on Monday. All of these experiences are what cause us to grow and build character. So 
remember that in your own trading. If you look back at everything you've been through this year, the ups and the downs, it's those downs in particular that cause you to grow not only as a trader, but as a person. So you have to learn to frame things out in a positive, positive light. And some people have different needs for uh, having significance in their life, you know, feeling unique or needed. Moms, I'm a mom, I like to feel needed there, you know, or a need to feel important perhaps if you make a lot of money. You know, all of these things contribute to a uh, significance. And, you know, it's going to depend on your own individual personality, how much this affects you. Lastly, with the personality, and this is what I really want to address here, this need, it's a human need for love and connection. So we'll skip the love part here because we all love one another, but I want to talk about that sense of connection, okay? It's a human need to want to feel connected with a community. It doesn't mean that you have to be sitting next to that person or like I said, sharing your trades, but everybody needs to have some type of community or support environment around them. Friendship, prayer, communicating with nature, even a dog, you know, if you don't have a significant other in your life can help feel, develop that feeling of connection. Okay, so for us as traders, I find myself, it can be very counterproductive oftentimes to share details of trades, you know, or, or go too far into what I'm thinking. It boxes me into a corner. But on the other hand, when I start talking with other traders and sharing my experiences, oh God, I can't believe I did that. Oh my God, this is Murphy's Law. Oh geez, you know, I, 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 I just got so lucky here on this trade, you know, whatever it is, all of these are very real experiences for us as traders. And um, for myself, having a couple people to kibitz with and make funny jokes and sick humor and stuff like that is really a huge source of stress relief for me, you know, so once in a blue moon, today was sort of a slow day. I posted a few things on Twitter, uh, you know, but you know, I kind of had fun over the last month doing tongue in cheek stuff with corn, you know, and it, it, it's just part of keeping things light. And that's for me how I like to relieve stress. So uh, I think that everybody has different ways of relieving stress, you know, obviously exercise in the gym and outside activities, but uh, Sometimes it's difficult to share things with a spouse who's not in the markets. They just, um, I, I've heard this from other people. I'm blessed because my husband has been in the markets for 40 years, but, but it is a challenging because I don't think uh, some of our family or friends around us truly understand what we can go through with these markets. It's like everything is condensed uh, and and compressed and then exploded on steroids. You know, just the intensity of what we are witnessing day after day. It, and so, um, it probably would be analogous to uh, to a neurosurgeon in the operating room. You know, or perhaps somebody's working on somebody's brain, and it's really intense. You know, they just can't communicate what they're going through in this uh, extreme environment. You know, to somebody that's not in the medical profession, you know, but it's probably a very profound experience for them. So I think that all of us as a group, the things that we have witnessed this year, I think are uh, profound experiences that we just don't quite recognize yet how profound they have been. And I'm not just talking about statistics from the pandemic. I'm talking about that first chart that showed the VIX extreme and that crude extreme and these stock extremes, these ridiculously profound um, moves to the upside and the downside in so many markets. So uh, I have a feeling it'll all start to sink in six months, six months from now 
but here's what we don't want to happen. We don't want that to creep up on us and all of a sudden you are just out of battery. You are drained and you do something dumb that costs you money in the markets. And I can tell you guys, honestly, so many times in the first 20 years of my trading career, I would do something so ridiculously stupid or dumb that was totally unnecessary that would cause a loss. That was my subconscious way of saying, damn it, Linda, <laughs> take some time off. If you refuse to take time off, I'm going to force you to take time off, you know, and you don't want it to come to that point. So take that to heart. So a last few words, this is just because I wanted to tie in a nice little neat knot the words uh, that Tony Robbins had uh, expressed. And I've never participated in his live workshops or, or coachings. I, I think I rented his original cassette tapes or I bought them uh, like in 1991. But this is from Mandy who uh, has done a lot of coaching work with him personally and been through a lot of his programs. So she is very good at picking the best of some of these people, be it Brett Steenberger or Steve Ward or, you know, awesome coaches out there, Tony Robbins, and extracting some of the best nuggets and putting it in very human words that aren't so dry. So, uh, you know, this growth and contribution are the last two needs. And Tony says that these are more spiritual needs as opposed to personality needs. So, um, you know, all of us want, want some type of personal growth. We just don't want to sit in a shell on the couch and grow roots and die. Okay, so and then co contribution, I think, is something that we consider a little bit more um, as we mature in our our life. At least that's true for myself. I mean, when I was in my early 20s, I think contribution and giving back was uh, probably uh, at the bottom of my list. Uh, and, and as I've gotten older, it starts to creep its way up and get closer to the top. So with this parting uh, quote. Our significance in life comes from something internal. It's what you give yourself. It comes from a sense of esteem that you give yourself. And you can't get that from outside sources, nor can you get that from your bottom line. Okay? So, um, you know, what matters is always what you think about yourself and whether you believe inside you, you are continuing to grow. Now, sometimes we just don't, see that, you know, when we're caught up in this day-to-day -day grind of, of the trading in the markets. I, I feel like I'm playing a perpetual chess game that's never going to stop. I'm always trying to think about, okay, and what's the next move? And then if they do that, and then what's the next move? And, you, you know, you can't play chess for 50 hours solid, just like you can't play a tennis game, you know, on Wimbledon there, center court Wimbledon, it does have an ending. And so we need to package our trading into little chapters, all right? And so a good time to close the chapter before you start a new one is obviously when you are in control, not because you've done something dumb. So perhaps you come off of a good win or, you know, you've made a good trade and then you can say, okay, let me stop and take a couple days off. And if you do that with the understanding that number one, you're not missing action. You're not having opportunity cost that instead of the opportunity cost, you're going to come back fresher and see the better opportunities more readily. You see, so I always hated to, you know, to take time off because uh, for me, I always felt like I was gonna be missing something, uh, you know, the rhythm, this, that, whatever excuses I wanted to make towards my warped mind. But then you realize that when you do take a couple days off and you come back, it's like all of a sudden somebody lifted the fog. 
you're wearing glasses again. Ah, I can see clearly now, you know, you get your objectivity back. So it's up to you to reframe that and think about, do I want to stay in this little mode of grind, grind, grind till I'm totally exhausted? Or even if you just take a day or two off to push yourself away from the markets and let yourself know that, you know, every trade is not the end all be all. I think that's an empowering thing for you to say to your self-conscious, I am in control and I can choose when to play the game. I'm not totally addicted to it, that I can't say when to stop or sit on the sidelines. You see the difference? One way you're sort of allowing yourself to be an addict and God knows, you know, the little clicking on the mouse that gives dopamine squirts to our brain and all these studies that have been done. There's no doubt that trading is highly addictive, just like gambling can be, you know, or alcohol or anything that does chemical things to our brain. All right, so trading and clicking on a mouse does chemical things to our brain and it has extremely addictive qualities. So acknowledge that. And then uh, I wanna leave you with uh, one last little quote as well. Uh, when Mandy was giving her talk, Damon piped in at the end and was talking about uh, this big hedge fund trader that he had to take out to uh, to dinner when they were doing brokering on the floor. This was before electronic trading and so forth. And, and this large trader would usually call down and give Damon four or 500 big S&P contracts to execute and was a very good client and a very good trader. And uh, so he came into town one day into Chicago and uh, the partners uh, with Damon uh, had prior commitments. So they told Damon, okay, you take this guy out on the town and entertain him and so forth and, you know, make sure he's comfortable as a client visiting Chicago. And so uh, Damon said, I, I don't know if they were out to dinner or walking around uh, the casinos or who knows, <laughs> doing something fun. And the trader turned to uh, Damon and started lecturing him you know, Damon asked him, uh, you know, what is it that has been enabled to, for you to stay such a good trader? What is your secret? And the trader turned to Damon and he said, don't chase the money. You can't chase the money. All right. In other words, you can't go looking for the trades. You know, you can't go looking to make something happen. You can't force it to happen. You need to sit back and play your game and then let the opportunity come to you. You, you can't force it to happen. So for example, if you're trading a volatility breakout system, I always default to this analogy because it's really truly only the one uh, thing that, that maintains a significant uh, robustness to it okay so um you know but the problem with it is is that maybe 80 percent of the profits might come on four days of the year <laughs> so it's a very uneven distribution but you know witness just two three days ago the volatility breakout system caught a short trade in the silver and a short trade on the gold covered them the next day and was the biggest win i've ever seen for that system and i've been monitoring it for 30 years uh, biggest win for that system that i've ever seen in those two markets so um there's a lesson there, you know, that it's it's playing your game and you can't force the cards. You can't force the hands. You have to stay there and wait for it to come to you. And it will. You have to have confidence that, that when you're fresh and recharged and you sit back down at that table to play again, you will be dealt some good hands and some good cards. But it's just when we get to the point where we have a little bit of burnout that um, you just can't see things straight and our cognitive abilities go uh, get a little bit deteriorated. So last word on trading communities and camaraderie and so forth. You guys are all in a wonderful forum now. It doesn't mean that you have to be 
active uh, during the day with your posts on the iofutures.com, uh, but it's a vehicle for you to meet familiar names or see familiar things. Um, I know a couple people have developed uh, a few friends on Twitter, so that's definitely an outlet for you. Um, you know, I again, I, I really strongly advise people not to get too crazy with this stuff when the markets are ripe and active in trading. You really need to be focused and concentrating on what you do. Um, if you know one or two other traders you've met, you can form your own little Skype groups. Um, even just, you know, talking out loud. Unfortunately, we can't go to conferences anymore, those types of vehicles. But just be aware that all you need is one friend that's a trader, okay? You know, even uh, Marty Schwartz, who is about as much of a loner as loner can be when traders, he still talks to a few people or used to. I haven't uh, been in contact with him for, for 10 years, but uh, I used to be in contact with him, and, and he's, a, he's a gruff, gruff person, not a person a personable person at all, but he still has, uh, you know, two or three people that you touch bases with. So keep that in mind. It's a, it's okay to share your experiences and so forth. Um, I'll just mention one last thing, and um, I'm always reticent to, uh, you know, sound like I'm doing any sales thing at all, but, you know, Damon and I, he, he, uh, he executed my trades for many years. You know, I was just a client, never said two personal words to him for 15 years. And, and uh, you know, then we became friends. And of course, now we're married. But I've known him for a super long time. And, you know, he was always doing his own thing. I was always doing my own thing. Uh, but, you know, for the first time, you know, just uh, back in uh, April, we said, you know, let's let's trade together. Let's start something, this little online community, and uh, you know, have some fun. So we started this little bit of a trading room here, and uh, you know, this is what we do now. We talk markets all day. You know, make trades all day. I didn't really make any great trades today. I was. Uh, pretty exhausted from not getting much sleep, you know, but we were framing things out all day and uh, uh, so forth. So um, if you're interested in that, you can always send me an email or go to my website, lindarashke.com, and read up on it. Uh, so that's just what we have, uh, you know, decided to have some fun with and build a little bit of a community around us. So I'm going to spend some time answering your questions on anything you want to talk about. And I've got, uh, let me just show you how cool this is here. I can hide, uh, I can do CQG charts here, see? So we can look at anything if you want to look at an individual chart. So uh, let me see here. Can you tell me how to expand these questions here so that I can? Uh, next to the little X is a square with an arrow. If you push that, it undocks it. Ah, and then you can it, use the it. arrows on the edges. there had to be so, a way to see yeah. this stuff. Okay, now we're in business. On the uh, on the uh, GC cave example, do you, you focus more on the volume traded or the price? Um, I look at a hundred percent the price action. Okay, and I'll tell you why. The reason is because for all my for for ninety percent of my trading career, we never even had volume. Okay, on the floor you didn't see volume. When you left the floor, volume wasn't reported. Um, you know, upstairs trading from upstairs. When we first had electronic platforms, it it really wasn't until like a you know just over a decade ago that we started getting volume that we could plot on a timely manner beneath the bars. So I can see, you can sense the volume from the activity level. And the tricky thing about volume is that 
number one, you, you can have skews. So for example, it can be uh, time of day skews in volume. Volume's always gonna be heaviest at the start of the session. You know, start of Europe, you'll have your surge in volume. Start of the US morning session, you'll have your surge in volume. So there's a little bit of a skew there. And then um, you can have skew with days of week, you know, if it's pre-FOMC and volume tends to be lighter when you're in a range. So for example, you know, we were in a range today and we've been in a range for the last couple days. So of course uh, the volume is going to be lighter. There's not that proverbial higher time frame player to move the price. Okay, so we're range bound. Um, and then also, I found, uh, for example, if I put this chart up of the gold, um, this is just a, uh, a bar chart, but I can equally make it, uh, whoops, I don't want to do that. I was going to make it a candlestick chart here and just let me get rid of all these pretty colors. I make it go purple when it pushes outside the Keltner channels just to indicate some momentum there for you. Okay, so if I look at this type of data, there is a ridiculously high correlation between the length of the bar and the volume. So 95% of the time, volume on a big bar like this is going to be much greater than the volume on the bars like this. And sometimes, not so often these days, we'll have what's a very narrow bar with high volume on the daily charts that can be a form of distribution or accumulation. You do not see that so much anymore. So I don't really need to see the volume. You can see it by the shape of the bar. And uh, conversely, you know, when you look at these things such as a volume divergence, okay, which is a very popular notion here, 10 to 1, you see the length of this swing right here to the upside and the length of this swing right here. So right off the bat, I don't really need an oscillator to tell me there's a divergence. I can see that by the length of the swing and the length of the individual bars. Now watch, if I pull up a momentum oscillator and you know this is just kind of marginal in here, this five minute period, um, you'll see it shows also the loss of momentum. So now let me see if I put up volume under here, if it's going to show the exact same thing. So I'll just plot volume at the bottom of this chart and we'll go back. And you can see right away how the volume right down here, this is simply five minute bars. The volume was much bigger on this swing than the volume here. So one of my goals as a trader is to strip away redundant information. The fewer the variables that I can reduce things down to, the more efficient my decision making process. And that's why it's pretty rare you'll ever see much more on my charts than one oscillator. It can be a stochastic, or this is a, uh, the 310 a moving average oscillator. And you'll see that I just use it for, for a quick confirmation. It gives me a feeling like this is the A leg up, then the B consolidation here, and then this just gives me that push that C push up, okay? So it just helps me feel a certain rhythm, but you don't really need this and you don't really need this. You can see the identical things. So also you can see this big ginormous volume bar here on the five minute, highly correlated with the underlying volume. So no, I don't look at the actual volume ever. I'm more interested in what is the overall structure. And for that, I'm simply, you know, drawing lines through the middle of these levels when we're, when we're coming back down. Okay, so this should have been a support except that we were just had way too much downside momentum here. 
I'll draw that swing high right there so that I know that if that previous resistance area, this is a little quasi bit of resistance here, the two data points, it usually takes two data points to, to define resistance. If that does not hold as support, if resistance does not become support, then we are going to trade to the middle of that prior zone. And if we don't find support in the middle of that prior zone, we're going to look below that previous swing low. And by George, we looked below this previous swing low here as well. Okay, so you see it's following the price action one data point at a time. And, and you can do this equally well without that volume distribution. It's just a lovely tape reading process. And this is what I do when I trade the uh, the E-minis, you know, one data point at a time. Will we get down to the opening price? Will we test that gap area? Are we accelerating as we approach these key levels? Or are we losing momentum into these key levels? And is there a chart pattern? Okay. So um, let me just back up a little bit here and start I can pretty much go through these uh, things pretty quickly. Somebody was asking if it's a good time to be a premium seller, and I've heard that you can't trade and sell premium. You know, everybody has a different style. I have a friend who makes a fabulous living, and all he does is sell uh, credit spreads. He sells put credit spreads and call credit spreads. So that's his way of safely selling premium. It doesn't mean that you have to sell straddles, all right? Uh, you want to have ways to protect yourself. And of course, it's also going to depend on your own capital and your experience level and how good you are at adjusting positions. So I, I'm not a premium seller per se because I find I do better if I'm positioning myself to try and capture a range expansion move or a fat tail and it's so it's just not my game you know I, I learned the hard way in 1982 <laughs> and I'll leave it at that so it's a it's a style thing those nodes are actually dark pool prints I chart them on my charts from the dark pool software Okay, you know, well, that's what's so cool about this business. Everybody has different ways of looking at things and seeing things, and it's sort of what works for Market you. Data connection you know, off. so where I might feel perfectly comfortable working off uh, just my Market bar charts and watching the tape. Other people might like the added little bit of confidence or ideas that uh, dark pools might suggest. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to go there on the uh, futures side because they really don't exist on the futures side like they do on the equity side. Uh, so um, we'll just leave it at Market that. Market data connection loss. Uh, 2020, the surprise packed year. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my God, somebody else did those personal power cassettes in 1990. You know, I did one of those. I did one a day and I kept a little notebook of my notes. They were like 30 minutes each. And I think there were like 30 of them or something like that. And I still have my little notebook that I, I took copious notes. And the only difference now is that my handwriting has become a whole lot less legible okay the volatility breakout system what is that that's a good point let me just show you uh, because this is a really cool concept and an important concept for uh principles of price behavior let me just get rid of some of these goofy little dots and so forth um so volatility breakout is a concept that uh, 
made Toby Craybell very famous and popular. He was looking for the range expansion off of the opening price. And what he modeled in his early book was all the patterns that preceded some of the better range expansion plays. And two things he looked at, he would look at, is it an NR7 type of day, a narrow range? Was it a hook day where there was a candlestick tail? Um, and he also looked at the sequence. Have we already had two days, low to high, low to high, two plus days? What if we had four plus days? Would that increase the likelihood of range expansion up or down the next day? So he did this very simplistic modeling, and that's what got him off to his start with his fund. Another person that popularized volatility breakout strategies is Larry Williams. And Larry also did break out off of the opening price. So you would take a function such as an average true range function, and perhaps it might say S&P opening plus or minus 10 handles. So if we opened up and we then traded up 10 points, and I'm just using an arbitrary number here, you would initiate a long trade. And then Larry's favorite exit was to exit on the first profitable opening or using a very, very wide stop. So uh, a lot of people aren't quite able to stomach some of Larry's stops, but that was his premise in doing the range expansion off the opening. So there's all kinds of variations to this. We can look at range expansion off of a swing low or a swing high. And in fact, if we sit there and we just do a volatility system, we can go down here and look at a simple volatility system. So this one has a pretty wide threshold and it would say that the volatility system went short here because it traded down a certain amount from the swing high and we traded up a certain amount you know, from the swing low. Now it's long and it's trailing a stop and this particular wide setting of the volatility system would have kept you in all the way up. And then of course it went short and it's probably going to go through a little whipsaw period here. So we can simply modify uh, this and say, okay, I'm just going to uh, use a, a two day look back period with one ATR. And all of a sudden you can see, you can come up with a, a much tighter type of system. Now this is sort of similar to uh, what Bob Buran does. And I'll just tell you lastly, uh, these other things. Now, just so you think that this is not the end all be all, typically volatility breakout systems can go through periods. And again, this is just an arbitrary setting here of getting lots of little whipsaws and so forth. And then they'll have that big glorious when the system went short here and, and rode it all the way down here. So it can have a big glorious win as well. So the, what Bob Buran did was uh, put forth that we can also come out with the range expansion off of the close. So here, for example, if I use the close here, I'm just going to eliminate this for now. If I use the close of this bar and added a range expansion function so that I go long, say for example, up here. So now I hold this overnight and I exit the next day. So that's the rhythm of the system that I uh, used to trade when I was doing this more mechanically. This particular bar here, the system actually went short. I don't, it, it actually went short in here. Now it's short, it's staying short and, and it actually uh, caught this down here and then covered the next day. If it had, uh, it, 
but you also had a, another entry here where you had the narrow contraction and then the range expansion off of that close and it gave a play to the downside. So there's a zillion, zillion trillion, gazillion variations on this. You can, you know, use two day look back, five day ranges, all kinds of different variables, all kinds of exit strategies, exit on the close, exit on the next open, you know, all these types of things. You can, you can go down a rabbit hole and spend literally a full year programming trade station, a million variations. And what will happen is if you try and optimize these functions or these settings, one set of parameters will work better one quarter than another quarter. So the point is that a broad set of parameters tends to have a uh, positive expectation. And that's what you want, you know, when you trade a system that lots of different settings will capture that for you. So that's the volatility breakout system. And the biggest lesson is respect the range expansion bars. Okay, <laughs> on Twitter, I was joking because I'm watching my little quote board. If you want to see what I look at during the day, I'll show you my, uh, this is what I'm usually watching right here. So my eyes are on my little market watch board, which is all empty right now because they're coming out with the with the uh, reset of the opening. But uh, so I just I thought it was humorous because silver was up 10 and copper was down 10 and the net change on both of them was perfectly inverse for like one second. You know, one had like minus 1050 and the other one said plus 1050 and I was like oh wow I have never seen that before so I thought that was pretty funny and um I, yeah yeah I would never try and arb the metals I just do not believe in that and uh, I think that that type of activity is a good way to get into trouble um there's no correlation with the copper and the uh, the silver. There are times where they are positively correlated, and there are times where they are inversely correlated. And right now, I'll just say as a preface, copper's in a down seasonal window. Um, the uh, the Silver had a very positive seasonal for July. The gold, perversely, normally does particularly well in August, although I think it got a running start this year. So, uh, no, it was just, see, this is what I was saying. I saw something like that, and I was like, wow, it's like seeing something uh, being down minus 666. Oh, the devil's print here. So, silly stuff. Silly, silly stuff. Ah. Uh, my thoughts, if Democrats take over in the U.S. and they implement trading transaction tax on trades. Well, first of all, um, what are the odds that they will be able to pass a trading tax? Zero. Zero percent because they need Wall Street to fund these freaking deficits. <laughs> they need Goldman Sachs to handle these bond auctions. I think that's a good talking point for the populist group out there. Uh, you know, there's always two sides to the coin. I think that the NASDAQ had a heck of a rally uh, yesterday because Kamala Harris is known to be extremely favorable to tech, especially tech companies in the Silicon Valley. So she is going to do her darndest to make sure that they are protected from having too much of tax consequences or breaking up their monopolies or, you know, whatever. <laughs> I mean, that's my hypothesis. And I really believe after all these years that uh, the politics have nothing to do with the market going up or down. It's all the Fed. What does the Fed's actions do? And, uh, you know, Tom McClellan is a good colleague. You know, we've been uh, Market Technician Association and some of these technical societies for years and years. And I remember him posting a very eye-opening chart 
10 years ago, and this is the, it was maybe it was like 12 years ago. This is the point about trader camaraderie and sharing things with each other. Cause I never would have latched onto this, but he showed a chart correlating debt levels with the market's performance because remember 10 years ago or maybe it was 14 years ago everybody was freaked out about the growing deficits oh my god these deficits keep expanding and we'll never be able to pay them back and so forth and he plotted a very simple chart that showed all the different ways that the increase in the deficit and the increase in the debt was directly correlated with the market rally okay because it's it's dollars being put out there it's it's fuel for the fire one way or the another if you're if you're doing it the sneaky way that the fed's been doing it or the more blatant way that the fed's been doing it what would really hurt the market <laughs> is if they tried to pay down these deficits and and not funding the debt in the same way that they have been, you know, uh, doing these repurchase programs and so forth and taking liquidity out of the system would be horribly detrimental to the market. So I just try and steer clear of the politics and keep my eyes firmly fixed on the monetary policy. So I hope that puts you to uh, hope, hope it puts things to rest. And, you know, the other thing is, let's say hypothetically, there was a trader tax. Let's say that it was one penny per contract. You know, is that going to affect my bottom line? No, it's not. You know, and, and I'm sure they would not do it anything that was a market impact, assuming that 1% chance of something happened. Now, if Warren was in office, you know, and, and Biden passed and she became president, well, maybe I'd have to scratch my head on that answer, but I don't think it's going to happen with that current ticket. Okay. By joining our trading room, what do you get access to? Is it all trading or any teaching provided? Uh, yeah, it's, it's nonstop. You hear me now, right? I, I only had two cups of coffee and I can sit there and talk forever and ever. So it's a little bit of everything. There is, um, I've got four zoom monitors going, uh, one on, on my screen, one on my trade station, Kyle, my assistant has one on, uh, on his, uh, trade station that also shows, uh, the photon charts when we're trading there. Damon has one showing his market profile software and the candle volumes. And you can see right where the little lines are, where he enters and then how he's working the trade where he covers. You know, sometimes he tells funny stories when it's slow. Um, you know, sometimes it is some, uh, you know, little lesson today uh, in the middle of the day, the volume was so light. I was talking about, um, structure with the beans and a structure in general learning to uh to train our eyes by these uh, swing highs and swing lows so i'll just uh, give you a little bit of a of a quick uh, synopsis here uh, in the ways that you can do this it's exactly what i was talking about with the uh just being able to read things with the bar charts and so forth and um we actually had uh, bought the beans yesterday and there was an outside update. And, um, you know, so we were looking for follow through from, from this and just talking about the swing highs and swing lows and putting this into context and then what the weekly charts would look like in light of this. And at certain points, even here, we had the five data points, one, two, three, four. So anytime you see those five data points, be it a wedge or a triangle, um, that is a chart formation that dictates trailing a stop, okay, because that's where you can get a better outlier and so forth. So at this level, you would have needed to trail a stop and it, it didn't lead to anything. It led to you basically getting stopped out. 
but if you do have a wedge, sometimes, you know, one out of four times, it's going to give you a bigger than expected win. So we look at those conditions that leads to a bigger expected win and how can we position ourselves that way. And of course, it doesn't happen, you know, 100% of the time. It doesn't even happen 50% of the time, but we want to recognize when it could happen. So the bull and bear traps, the, the chart formations, there's all different kinds of structure that we're constantly reviewing and looking at charts. And, and it makes it fun when it's in the middle of the day. So I find that uh, you can take what you want from it. You can, um, you know, some people just trade stock options. You know, we have this little system that we, uh, we put up the stock trades on the trade station. We don't, you know, specifically go over, we're buying an option here or that type of thing. But uh, for example, this morning to the upside, we had three bars up off of uh, work day, and that would have been one of the stronger ones to the upside. And keep in mind, this was the lightest volume day of the year. And NTAP had three five minute bars to the downside. Um, so, just, you know, little subtle things like that that could be some of the better stocks to trade for the day. But I'd say maybe only 15% of the members do that. And then we just finished a four week uh, sequence with Mandy uh, lecturing on Monday nights uh on on uh, coaching stuff so that last uh recording that i posted to our homepage lindarashki.net that you can go listen to that was a series of four so then we record all these and they're in the resource section for the members so there's tons of of things i promise you'll never get bored wednesday night um we about three out of four weeks out of the month we we go over stock charts so i'll pull up my uh trade station radar scan and we sort for certain things out of a database of uh, 250 stocks and we look at the relative strength leaders and how that's shifting and you could see very early on the rotation in some of the groups so we have two different ways of uh, sifting through the relative strength changes there so that's fun and then tuesdays and thursday evenings we leave the room open for people if they just want to kibitz amongst themselves open mic night share videos night so it's you know for me it's a lifestyle for me. This is all I know. You know, if somebody didn't pull me out of my office, I would sit here and get burnout, you know, after three days straight from sitting here for three days straight. So, you know, this is, um, it's our community and, uh, you know, we, we welcome people to, to uh, join us if you want. Um, split coming on Tesla and Apple. What can we expect from those markets? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, if we could really anticipate it and price it in, I think the market would have already discounted it. I'll tell you, these quants have some pretty amazing models these days. And I always go by the fact that I'm not going to play a guessing game. I'm going to follow the footprints in the market. Um, so, you know, when you ask what is the best book on price action, okay, price action has sort of become a real euphemism i think it's uh it's it can refer to so many different things for me price action is all about watching the swings up and swing down so for me price action is really uh you know about uh following the tape and um you know i don't need to have all these little lines and wiggles and jiggles here but you know, it, it's, you know, it, it's watching the tests, the rejects. So uh, to me, this is price action. It's, it's, it's um, implying that you're looking for the next swing only. Okay. So for me, that's true swing trading. It doesn't have to be in one day out the next. That's a little bit of a myth. If you're trading a swing on a daily chart, you could be holding a position for three weeks to goodness knows how long. Right. And if you're trading a swing on a two minute chart, you know, it, it's going to be a different dynamic. So, um, 
you know, to me, this this whole thing is price action. Now, there's a different group out there that sort of popularized this uh, candlestick bar by bar approach uh, that was popularized by Al Brooks. And I think, gosh knows, he's written a gazillion books on this stuff. And uh, it might do something for you or it might not. Um, we'll just uh, take a little look here at uh, a chart. And, uh, you know, I know I have friends that followed him for three years before they were really able to adapt certain little pieces to their own trading, okay? So what I don't see people having much success with, and I'm not here, I mean, everybody uh, puts things out there that have value, okay? So you can always pick up little nuggets here and there. I have a friend who is at exceptionally good at, uh, you know, looking at the little breakout formations with the uh, bar by bar stuff. And the first thing he will tell you is do not look for five minute candle bar by bars when the volume is too light. You will get chopped to smithereens. And that is exactly what I see with traders who try to follow five minute candlestick charts is they end up over trading. They end up taking way too many marginal trades. It's a lot of hard work to put it in context. Al Brooks is exceptionally good at what he does because he's been doing it for 25 years, doing nothing but this. Okay. But, uh, that's my opinion on, um, the tricky things. Now, you know, my friend likes to look for the eat the tail patterns, you know, and put things in context like that. But it's it's a it's a hard, uh, scrappy game. That's my opinion. Um, but you know, if it works for you and you can find pieces, and I can certainly find value in certain candlestick patterns and trading bar by bar that way, it's just essential that you, number one, uh, do it in heavier volume times, and number two, always put it in context of that higher time frame. Hey, Linda. Yes. All right, we're getting long on time, so I'm going to pose one last question to you. Absolutely. What what is the number one thing that you would suggest a trader do to recharge for the rest of the year? What's the one nugget you, you would like them to take away from this? First of all, the way you talk to yourself, don't look back at anything that's happened in the past. Don't revisit bad times. Don't revisit bad trades. That is something that drains your battery. There's a time and a place for reviewing our trades and our performance and so forth and reviewing things that happen during the year. But when your batteries are low, the last thing you want to do is anything that's going to be negative talk. So in I encourage people do whatever you need to do to uh, bring sunshine into your life. Honestly, I go out and I buy flowers at the store and I put them on my counter. I take my dog for walks and I, I go walk in the green grass and, and, you know, and if you have to take a day off, that's fine. Go get a massage. So do something that says, I love myself and I am worthy of that and I deserve that. So that's the very first thing that you can do for yourself. It doesn't have anything to do with journaling and keeping notebooks and so forth. So um, that's a good start. And, um, you know, try to see the bright spot on the horizon. We can choose you know, what we allow in our life. I mean, you can choose to listen to CNN and Fox and the political commentators, or you can choose to listen to classical music or chill out music or something like that. So you can choose the things that you allow in your environment. So when your batteries are low, 
make the choice to bring in rejuvenating things. And I'll just leave it at that. I see one last question on the S&P workshop that we're doing at the end of the month with